Hi guys, it's Dom from Soundsphere here. Earlier on today, I had the great fortune of chatting to Billy Lunn from The Subways, uh, a bucket list interview for me and for Soundsphere, uh, chatting to Billy about mental health, uh, the new record, the new forthcoming untitled record, uh, the history of The Subways, the legacy, um, and a bunch more stuff. So I'm super buzzed uh, that I could have this chat with Billy, and I hope you guys enjoy it as much as I enjoyed doing it. And uh, I'll see you guys soon. Thanks for watching. Billy, uh, one of the questions I like to ask um, people in your position, people that have toured around the world, people that have uh, been in a band that many would deem uh, successful in many ways, um, uh, from an outsider's perspective, people outside of yourself, obviously you're in the band making the music. So for, to start us off, how do you define success both as an artist and as a person? That's a great question because that's something that I've been tussling with for like a number of years now. And I think um, when we first started out, it was really difficult to gauge any sort of perspective on success because there was just such a whirlwind happening um, and so much going on. Uh, we were on TV uh, in America, like the OC, and then uh, David Letterman, Conan O'Brien, Craig Ferguson were touring America. And then we we're in Australia, like sharing the stage with Iggy Pop and um jack white and uh and then tour in europe and in the uk and at the, at the same time it still felt like oh god i'm just not a success you know i'm not as successful as this band i'm not as, as successful as this artist and eventually you sort of i don't know if it's to do with age or just um to do with like um <sighs> becoming more at peace with yourself uh you realize that being able to wake up every single day and play music for a living is by definition success you know because I grew up uh, dreaming of being in a rock band and when I left school I had like zero prospects I was still living in my um, my parents council house in Wellington City um, I remember my mum taking me to the job centre in the town centre and just being like right okay pick something off of the billboard and I was like well uh, linen porter at a hotel that sounds pretty easy <laughs> you know get up early get the bus um, and just sort of uh, package up the dirty linen from the hotel rooms and ship them off. And, and to me, that was kind of successful because <laughs> I was getting to listen to all my favourite bands whilst I was doing this job. Um, and uh, at the same time, I could finish my job and just check out for the rest of the day and just do what I wanted to do. And, and that was like making songs and recording demos in my parents' uh, kitchen um, and carrying on with the band. And then, you know, every weekend we'd have a gig in London. Um, so, you know, when we were doing all this wild stuff, like touring the world, that was like, it, it, even though you're looking at other bands and like, are we really successful in comparison to all these other really successful chart topping bands? And you're like, well, yeah, I am successful because I would come home after a tour and I'd be going, ah, oh, you know, I'm so tired. I'll be having a <laughs> pint with my mates or we'll be out for an Indian um, uh, dinner or lunch. Uh, somewhere at a cafe in the in the town centre and I'd be like oh I'm just so tired I'm so tired and they'd be looking at me like are you serious we've been working 24 hours in a factory in Essex like so um, <laughs> yeah I think I think really it's all relative and it's society's done a really really good job at making us feel like we have to work harder we have to do better we have to be better um and you know you won't be happy until your your fingers are bleeding that kind of like you know work until you die mentality yeah and um I think I got to a point in my life where I was like I don't want to be on my deathbed and being like god I worked so hard in my entire life what I wanted was to be able to go god I was there for my loved ones and and like you know I got to spend some valuable time with them um and, you know, uh, I got to just have these really wild, adventurous experiences. And being in the band has really facil facilitated that because I've mm. been able to go off on tour and have these wild adventures and see all these different places and meet all these fantastic people and meet all my favourite bands, which is one of the, you know, it's not, it's not something that's mentioned a lot because I think so many bands and so many band members try and play it cool. Like, yeah, we don't care, whatever. This is really <laughs> just like... And but we're we're very much like you know every time we've met Dave Grohl we've just been like oh my god we worship you you're incredible hello we're called the subways we love you he's like I know how are you doing um 
and we never we never forget that we are given these great opportunities to meet our heroes the people that have like shaped our lives not just like uh made music that made us really happy or soundtracked the events of our lives but actually made us feel such like profound feelings thanks to their music so uh that that's all success um and yeah. uh it's something i'm always trying to reinforce uh to people who I see are like, ah, oh, but you know, this person that I know is doing really, really well. And I'm like, well, but you're doing really well. You're alive, you know? And <laughs> yeah. it's it's difficult to say because times are so tough at the moment. It's difficult to remind people how lucky they are because, mm. you know, everyone is um, going through uh, a certain amount of hardship and particularly like society's most vulnerable and society's most marginalized are under the cosh at the moment um, with all these oligarchs and all these um, uh, these powerful industry owners and uh, all these powerful governments uh, are, are basically just like uh, putting so much pressure on everyone and it's really difficult to go let's try and savor the moment like mm. It's tough to say to someone in a certain position that's really, really struggling at the moment, carpe diem. It's, yeah. It feels I, really privileged, doesn't it? Absolutely, um, yeah. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, I think, I th sorry, I, I, no, but, no, you know, I, I think I think one thing that I'm always really mindful of is that I've had it very good, you know, mm. um, and uh, yeah, that, you know, being able to have this this experience of being able to talk about music, the, the one thing in my life that's kept me alive all this time uh, is is success so yeah absolutely man and, and you know congratulations on all of that and obviously you've got a new record coming out soon which we'll we'll, we'll get into um I, I do want to ask you what is the sort of lesson what is the what sort of reality the one reality about the music industry again because you've you've studied as well you've done other things mm. you know since the beginning of the subways you've, you've you've branched out and achieved other things as well what, what's one of the realities that you would like to bestow on a younger person, a younger uh, musician, something you wish you'd known at the start of your career? Because again, you know, the perception of the subways and, you know, all the streams and the thousands of streams and the tours mm. is one thing, but there's also some realities that, that you know, perhaps, you know, uh, uh, you know, someone of your knowledge base, you know, could impart on somebody. What is the one kind of, um, I should really fine tune this question. What is the one reality about the music industry and create and wider creative arts that you wish younger musicians and artists knew about? No, that's a fantastic question. And uh, the one thing that I, I desperately wish I could go back in time and say to myself is what you care about really, really matters, you know? Uh, and in particular, the creative arts industry, uh, because I remember uh, growing up, going through school, uh, I had to fight when I was in school, I wanted to do drama and music. And my teachers were like, no, you've got to do a humanities. You've got to do like a geography or a history. And I was like, no, but this is the stuff I really care about. And I had to get my mum to come into school and go, he cares about these two things. Don't make him pick. So eventually they relented. They're like, okay, go off. And, but you know, you're, you're screwing your, uh, your path to opportunity in a career in whatever. And I was like, well, I can't see myself like uh, employing, the skills that I'd learn through history or geography, particularly like at a GCSE level in what I want to do. And that's be a musician, be an artist. So from that point, I'm like, so this music and this theater and films and books, does all this stuff, does this mean anything? Cause like we are constantly reminded that if something doesn't have like an immediate practical utility to society, then it's not by definition valuable. But I think what we've learned, particularly over the like, the last three years during the pandemic is that it's the creative arts industry that's got us through this intact especially over you know uh, the course of the last 10 years through uh, Tory austerity uh, the one thing even though funding has been cut to creative arts industries to social programs to education the one thing that's kept the economy afloat is the creative arts industry and that's even you know standing up against all the resistance that society and particularly a Tory government can um, muster. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I, I went through my whole career in this band right up until a couple of years ago thinking what I do doesn't matter. You know, really, it doesn't matter. You know, I'm not building houses. I'm not like forging electricity and, and, and connecting uh, telephone lines. I'm not... Um, yeah. 
you know, I'm not fixing people in hospitals, but um, there's something in us that has been there since the very beginning of human civilization that requires expression, that requires being understood, um, whether it's like when we were dancing around the campfire praying for rain, you know, banging drums, singing melodies. That's how we passed on stories to each other because that's really us learning about ourselves. And if we can't learn about ourselves and know ourselves, we can't really function. Um, over the last year or so, that's something that I've learned the hard way because uh, I've I've kind of, you know, I've been relatively open about my mm. uh, mental mm. health struggles, but mm. I've never really been diagnosed or anything but I suffered a breakdown I felt suicidal uh, and then eventually I was taken to a crisis center and they said you've got borderline personality disorder mm. um, and uh, I, I I think that was all all that pent-up frustration all that pent-up uh, uh, trauma was because I hadn't really given myself the time to look inwards and reflect. Um, and art is a really big part of that. I think one of the reasons why I'm alive today is because art allowed me that door ever so slightly ajar to kind of reflect on who I was through music um, and to understand myself by understanding what I really love about certain types of music or certain types of film or certain types of books. So uh, you know, and even through testimony of, of people that I've talked to over the years, they've said, like, I am being totally honest here. Music saved my life. Mm. I wouldn't be alive here today if it wasn't for my favorite bands, uh, My Chemical Romance or uh, The Supremes or like mm. uh, the words of Bob Dylan. I wouldn't be here. Mm. So um, if there's one thing that I could uh, emphasize to younger musicians or artists of any stripe is that your art matters your expression matters yeah uh, the the people in the arts industry that you value they matter no matter what this Tory government says no matter what utilitarians say yeah we're not building houses yeah. we but but we're understanding human civilization absolutely and saving lives in, in a lot of contexts which is you know something that you mentioned there which i think is is beautiful and that's something i, I want to go on to in my next couple of questions um but but i wanted to sort of take it away from the band uh, for a second and kind of take you back to say when you started your career and the success of young for eternity if you could look at yourself then you know, and what you've learned about yourselves, obviously, you know, I, I, you know, it's very public. You have, you know, been more open about your mental health struggles recently and things like that. But from the person you were back then, what, what's the biggest, you know, how have you changed and developed? What have you learned about yourself from that person you were up until this point? I think like looking back, uh, I was so uptight. You know, um, I, I don't think I gave myself the chance to enjoy it as much as I probably should have. And uh, I think over the course of the last 15 years, uh, we in the arts industry, but generally we in society have become more uh, accepting to the idea of, um, of, of being ourselves a bit more. I mean, uh, even 15 years ago, um, the music industry was so much more hyper masculine was so much more sort of patriarchal minded um and uh we were so young <laughs> you know i look at um i look at how young we were uh when we made young for eternity um and and also in relation to like how uh how old some of our contemporaries were at the time we felt like these right upstarts uh these real childish foolish um uh impish little creatures kind of just coming in and playing rock and roll and all these really mature musicians in leather jackets looking really dead <laughs> yeah. cool and we're just like flailing around the stage um but at the same time you know even though the we had this sense of wild abandon and you can really hear that in young fraternity i was so uptight and I think that really is just by virtue of being in the public eye from such a young age mm. and <laughs> trying to find my foot in, find my sense of identity, uh, um, establish kind of who we were as a band when I, I was still like 
I don't know. My, my friends were going to university and making all these stupid mistakes and, you know, finding out who they were and living in these tiny cramped little houses with other people <laughs> and, and, yeah. and gaining these social skills that I, I you know, I, I felt like I missed out on. I remember when we were first touring Young Fraternity and all my mates were at university and, um, you know, that I, I would see them crowd surf and like, hey, how you doing, Sam? How you doing, Chris? <laughs> yeah. You're right, you know. Um, and then they'd be like, oh, come and, you know, come, let's go to a club afterwards. I'm like, dude, I've got like 40 more dates to do. <laughs> yeah. I've got to pack up my equipment and, and go off to the other side of the country. Um, so there was this huge um, amount of responsibility. So mm -hmm. I do look back and I'm like, oh, I was so uptight. But at the same time, like I, I dealt with a lot of responsibility at such a young age. And I think I dealt with that quite well. And we were all so precocious, you know. Um, some of the songs we wrote, some of the performances that we did, I look back and I'm like, how did we do that? <laughs> I couldn't do that now. <laughs> and I think um, that has something to do with the, like the vigor of youth, doesn't it? Uh, and also like the naivety of youth. Um, I remember when we did our first South by Southwest, I can't remember which year it was, maybe 2005 or like 20 years old. And we've done three performances in a day. We got out of, a, out of a van, out of the van door, walked through another door and we're walking out on stage. And I'm like, oh, hey, someone handed me my guitar. And we did like an hours long performance again in front of like Seymour Stein and all these big industry bods. And you just kind of went with it. Yeah. Um, and uh uh, yeah, like I said, as much as I was uptight, at the same time, I was kind of like just going with the flow. Um, and I think, uh, you know, you mentioned earlier that I took some time out to go and study. Uh, mm. So, yeah, after after I recorded and mixed and we toured our fourth album, self-titled self album, uh, I just got over uh, a really bad bout of um, alcoholism and I was in mm. recovery and I was like, you know, what? I want to take a couple of years out of the band. I want to go read some books, just not be in a band for a couple of years and, and rest my ears because my ears haven't stopped ringing since I was 10 years old. Since I went, first went to see ACDC at Wembley Stadium. So um, I was like, you know, I just want to go sit in the library for three years um, and uh being able to sort of just become a, an appreciator of music again, you know, not a participator, but just an appreciator uh, was a really lovely, calming, invigorating experience. Um, yeah. And I think, you know, if I hadn't have done that, I don't think we would have written this new album at all. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, that, that was really special. Uh, so um yeah you know i was i was very single-minded when i was younger during young fraternity very single-minded very much yeah. like the band is everything and now i've got to a stage in my life where i'm like music is dead important to me but you know what i love my family too yeah. <laughs> and i'm yeah. not i want to be there for them Absolutely. um because I, I feel like I've, I've i've been on a jolly for the last 15 years touring the world and and, and now it's time to step back and 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 uh, hand over the mic and and um and be there for the younger bands and be there for my friends and family as well yeah which is which is a lovely space to be in and uh, before we do uh, again do a bit more talk on the new record and what's coming up uh, one of the things i do as part of my day job is work with a lot of young people who uh, come right. from challenging backgrounds and they struggle for motivation they perhaps come to uh, they come to us thinking you know they've done so they've, they've maybe struggled with addiction they've maybe right. may, maybe hurt some people uh, in various ways and, and what's struggling. the organization that sounds amazing yeah so i've done so it's called the warren youth project and it's in right. Hull, in east yorkshire i uh, love hull yeah oh. hull's great i was just talking to someone the other day about Hull. i love hull yeah yeah so we we ended we do a lot we do a lot of work with young people that come from there great you know, training people up and, and helping them get skills in journalism things like that yeah they, they often come with um certain mental health issues and they struggle again mm. you know they struggle with self-image maybe they've hurt you know maybe they've upset some people maybe yeah they've, maybe they've, yeah. you know and they're struggling with you know the kind of person they they want to be versus the person mm. they think they are and as, as someone again who has you know has been open about difficulties and challenges that they've been through yeah. uh, recently and, and before you know what advice would you have for any young person who who is who is you know feeling guilt and shame for some mm. of the things they may have done or uh, maybe they're struggling with addiction and they don't necessarily know how to to move past that Sure. Um, I, I found that living um, in the moment, 
and 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 seeing the day through is is a great help for me um mm. you know i uh, i deal with a lot of guilt and shame you know because of my addiction but also because you know um i've not necessarily been the best person <laughs> my best self you know um i've betrayed a lot of people in my life um i've not been there i've hurt a lot of people in my life um and one thing that's got me through this is knowing that at the very least i want to be a better person mm. um and that is something that keeps my head above the water. Um, if you know that you want to be a better person, that is some fantastic light at the end of the tunnel, you know? Um, and uh, God, realizing that we are not complete pictures, mm. that we are not finished stories, that we are constantly evolving changing growing sometimes regressing personalities mm. um sometimes uh we continue to make mistakes mm. but i i find that um knowing that there is space to want to be better and mm. um and knowing that there's space for the opportunity to be better is one hell of a uh, you know, uh, um, uh, a boy in which to sort of, you know, wrap yeah. yourself around and just to get a bit of air, just to, you know, hold yourself up for a second and try and find your feet. Um, yeah. You know, these are, these are, it's so tough. It's so tough to forgive yourself. Um, but I think that in itself is like a shining beacon because you realize you realize that things can get better, that you can be better. Um, and I, a huge part of the struggle is, is not coming to the realization that you've done wrong. Mm. Um, and and one, of the, one of the real fears that I have in my life is not being able to tell the difference between right and wrong. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and I think that that, you know, I, I, I'm constantly unsure of myself. And I'm always asking my wife, like, did I respond appropriately in that situation? Because I'm terrible at reading faces. I'm terrible at gauging tones. And, mm -hmm. um, uh, my, you know, my family's um, got a long line of autism uh, mm -hmm. and a long line of uh, bipolar disorder and, and borderline personality disorder and schizophrenia. So we unfortunately have a history of being unable to... Uh, uh, gain a purchase on yeah. on like where we are in a situation how we're doing and and where we're going um and that's why you know living in the now and and uh um savoring the present moment is is something that keeps me on track because i'm like okay don't hold on too much to yesterday uh, to yesterday but at the same time use yesterday as mm. a, yeah. a a a um a path by which to kind of gauge the future but if you reach too far into the future you're going to overwhelm yourself you're going to crumble everything's going to be unreachable make reachable goals mm, mm. um and yeah. uh yeah but but the main thing i mean the main thing is today the main thing is knowing what you've done wrong and knowing how to get it right again absolutely you know, those are the three things Absolutely. Thank you very much, Billy, for, for being so honest about that stuff, because, again, it, it can't be easy to open up. And, and, and I, you know, and I do respect, you know, like I say, when I was reading those articles uh, you know, about you opening up on your struggles, you know, how difficult mm. that must have been. How are you feeling at the moment? You know, what, what, how are you feeling in this space, in this moment, uh, in this yeah. time in your life uh, now, right now? Uh, it's it's um, it's difficult because, like, I feel um, I feel like I'm actually like living the real me, you know, mm. I, I feel like I'm, I'm being honest, not just with myself, but with everyone else by saying, look, I've made mistakes. And I think one of the really toxic elements of the music industry is the idea of cool <laughs> or the, you know, the mythical rock icon, you know, this kind of beheld idol. Uh, and, and we all kind of liquidate ourselves because they are like the shining beacon of rock and roll. This whole idea of the saviors of rock and roll, I find it so distasteful. This, this sheen, um, this smokescreen that mm -hmm. artists, I think, feel 
obligated to create between them and and, and their their audiences um is uh, is something is a huge impediment uh to not just like the understanding of the truth of our art but also like of understanding our artists as people who are flawed like everybody else trust me yeah. okay <laughs> um and i feel like um i finally feel part of a community you know because mm. i always felt so I've, for my entire life i felt isolated and mm. I, I think that has something to do with my maybe um the way i think in my mental health condition i i mm. I, I go through periods of dissociation where i i don't feel myself you know i i don't i i feel like an um i said this to the to the psychiatrist uh when i was being diagnosed i said i feel like this empty see-through vessel that just has like air going in and out of it mm. uh, and i felt that for so many years um and being honest <laughs> with people as far and it was the most frightening thing i've ever done owning up to my I mistakes can imagine. yeah um pressing that button with my wife sat opposite me on a table going i i'm not going to be able to wake up tomorrow if i don't do this Mm. You know, I was like, if I don't do this, I don't think I'm going to be able to live with myself. I have to be honest with people about who I am and what mm. I've done. And and she was like, that's amazing. Go for it. But it, as much as I wanted to do it, my yeah. God, I just did not want to do it. But I did it. Um, and I've never really looked back because uh, I I feel like I'm the truest me I can ever be in my entire life. And now I feel like uh the the that tomorrow is uh an even better opportunity for me to write better music and, and be a better person um yeah. and to contribute to the culture that I, I care so much about um and you know we've always been a band that has been you know on the stage uh but at the same time um whilst we're on the stage, we, we want to break down that barrier between us and, and the audience. You know, we're constantly trying to engage with the crowd and audience participation. And when we're off the stage, we're always going out front and seeing how people are, whether they like the show and, you know, we make good friends with our fans. If we're playing a festival, we all go, right, let's all go for a walk around the festival because it's really important for us not just to play the festival, but to yeah. know the festival we're playing, yeah. know the audience we're playing to. Um, also, because it's just fun just getting to go out and see things. Mm. Um, but so many bands we know get off the tour bus and go on stage, play the show, shower, get back on the tour bus, and they kind of yearn for, for home. And um, there are so many conversations I've had with many of our contemporaries that are just like, God, I just want to go home and I'm like yeah. this is this is the greatest thing in the world like I want to do this every day for the rest of my life yeah um so uh you know we engage a lot with our uh, audiences on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook um uh, for better or worse so for me to um to finally be, on, on, be honest and open with people was it, it just felt like uh the corollary of, of of kind of like the philosophy we've set from the very beginning of being in this band yeah um and hopefully, um, you know, I, I don't want to be arrogant enough to presume that, you know, my actions will influence or inspire anyone else. But if it can help someone realize that they are in the same position and maybe they want to be honest, too, then um, then, it, you know, that's been worth it because um, all I want to do now is just help people. <laughs> yeah. Um, and yeah and uh and just be a better person so yeah that's awesome and what well, well, you know i wish you the best luck with it and it's a it's a pleasure to to sit with you here today and hear you reflect like that as well you know thank you very much for your honesty well thank you for asking the question don uh, it's you know these are really interesting questions uh, and i think they're all so essential so it's my it's my absolute pleasure uh, two or three more uh, promo questions uh for, for the band because <laughs> we've we've, uh, we've not done that yet um obviously you mentioned you know mentioned a little bit about the future and the, and the new record coming up you know as well obviously the band has gone through some changes uh, recently obviously founding member uh, josh leaving and camille joining yeah. how, how again you know uh very because you can't speak for the rest of the band but how yeah. are you feeling how are you personally feeling about the future uh with this change and obviously a new new music on the horizon um i feel like um i feel like a sense of renewal you know uh um 
Josh and I being brothers in this band, you know, we've known each other since Josh came out of our mum's womb and we grew up together and we, you know, fell in love with uh, the same football team together and we, you know, we formed the bands together. We went swimming together and that's where we met Charlotte, you know, so uh, we've, we've, we've been through so much together. And when Josh decided that he wanted to leave the band, um, my heart was broken, but at the same time, I, I, I fully understood that it was so important for him to be there for his girlfriend, for his daughter, and to go off and to pursue his own musical dreams, whatever they might be. Um, and he's actually now um, studying classical civilization and he's acing every single essay. You know, I, <laughs> I read English at Cambridge. He came in the other day uh, uh, whilst I was at um, uh, my dad's and said, oh, can you just read through this essay? Be better than any essay I've ever written. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. And so I'm so I'm so proud of him. Um, and as soon as we got Camille and uh, uh, we played our first song with Camille, Charlotte and I looked at each other and we just went, well, this is new, isn't it? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, this is exciting. But also, um, you know, Josh is one of those drummers um, who it's impossible to replace mm. because he's so idiosyncratic. But we feel like Camille is equally as idiosyncratic. Um, and uh, <laughs> over such a short time, she's become our best friend and we love her so much. And uh, we played our first uh, European show together last month and it was just an absolute dream uh, it was her first go uh, on a nightliner um, during our um, our UK tour and just seeing her face light up when she first went to her bunk and I was like right so this is this is how you want to sleep when you're in your bunk and <laughs> you know this is where you put your clothes and all this stuff it was just it felt like it felt right you know yeah. it felt so right um and uh, it's just so nice having the um, gender dynamic of the mm. band uh, uh, change um, in the way that it has, um, because Charlotte has gone so long as a woman in a, a very, very male domina dominated music industry. Uh, you know, when we remember reading some of the first reviews uh, from some big, big publications back in the day when we were only 19 or 20 and she was mm. being hypersexualized by a lot of uh, male journalists, unfortunately. Mm. And if those articles were published now, they would be absolutely ripped to shreds, mm -hmm. but she got through it. And, um, and to see just how diversified the uh, music industry has become over the last several years has been such a beautiful thing to bear witness to. Um, so it only feels uh, right that, you know, if, if Josh were to go, that, that we um, should uh, uh, follow through with, um, with our beliefs and our philosophies and, and uh, use that empty seat to uh, give representation to a, uh, a wildly underrepresented uh, gender in the music industry. So, um, yeah, uh, but she's just like, yeah, we, she, I can't believe how quickly she took to these songs, you know, it yeah. was just, it, it just felt like, uh, like a flare had been lit and, and all of, all of a sudden we could see again, you know, because when Josh left the band, we, we felt kind of rudderless and, and, and drifting and, mm. Um, that was made even worse because we were in the middle of a pandemic and we didn't know when we were going to be back on tour again. So when we met up with Camille for the first time and she started playing, oh yeah, we were just like, hope, there is hope. <laughs> um, and, and we just cannot wait to spend uh, the rest of our career with her. So, oh man, yeah. that's exciting. What a wonderful testament as well. I, I can't wait to, to see how it goes. Obviously, you, you, you have released a track you kill my cool uh, from the new stuff obviously as yet mm. untitled uh, would you say that that is a perfect representation of the new direction well the, the new material and what you're going for or is that just a taster uh it definitely sets the tone i mean uh, the synths that you hear in the mm. intro they are expanded uh on uh, in some of the songs in uh, the rest of the record i mean um i think because of the pandemic and lockdown and because uh you know i spent those years at university just be being a music 
music appreciator again. Um, I decided, you know what, we've made four records with just drums, bass, guitar, vocals, backing vocals. Let's let's try something new. Mm. I got lost down this very dark alley of uh, Roland drum machines and synthesizers. I fell in love with the Juno mm. 60 and the 808 and 909. Yeah, um, so we have uh, used uh, a number of those sounds on the record. Um, the best song we've ever written is yet to be released and I can't wait for everyone to hear it. It's actually the title track of the record. Um, but You Kill My Call is is indicative of what's coming, but um, it's still like, I listen to the album and I'm like, each song has a vein of uh, consistency with the rest of the songs on the album, but at the same yeah. time it's its own personality yeah. or its own colour. So okay. you kill my call with that gritty, dirty, sleazy <laughs> friend that we have. Uh, and I don't know what we're going to choose for the next single, but there are some hella poppy songs. I mean, I was listening to um, Speaker Box, uh, Big Boy's uh, 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 Big Boy's disc on the um, Love Below Speaker Box uh, Outcast double album. And um, uh one of the songs is hugely influenced by uh, the way you move. Yeah. Um, and at the same time, I was listening to a lot of uh, Deftones Diamond Eyes record, which yeah. is like, I Beautiful. think in my top top five all-time yeah. favourite records, like just that's been, I, I've played that at least once a week for the last five years. <laughs> yeah, man, love it. Love it. Oh, it's Beautiful. just so, so great. If, if you're into your uh, sort of 80 cents, have you heard that Cross's um, side project of Chino's? No. Oh. oh, dude, it's um, it's um, Sean from Far and Chino from Deftones, and they do oh. they're doing electronic music. It's just called Crosses. It's um, that's my jam. Uh, oh, dude, like you, hopefully you'll enjoy. It. Go let let me know on Twitter or something if I you will, because it's uh, it's fantastic. Anyway, sorry I interrupted you. No, that's uh, great. I, I'm all all for this. I mean, I one of the great things about um the last couple of years is um falling in love with Bandcamp because I've uh, you know, I've got my account on Bandcamp and I got heavily into synthwave and, <laughs> you know, like this kind of retro synth music. There's kind of like a fusion of uh, 80s sci-fi soundtracks yeah. and uh, and all the like the new wave sounds that came from the 80s. Um, and that's really influenced the new album. Uh one of the songs uh, on the record is like really, really rocky, but the chorus just suddenly goes synth land. <laughs> you know? um, and then at the same time, we've got like this really, we've got a seven minute postmodern track about like the, uh, uh, the discovery of the self or like the dismantling of the self. So there, it's like cut into three parts. Uh, the first part is like a seventies rock track. The second part is like a eighties new wave track. Uh, and the third part is like this misfit style punk nice. <laughs> uh, tra um, uh, movement. Nice. Um, and it ends with this uh, Antonin Artaud sample <laughs> that I got from this really old vinyl uh, that I found in a charity shop of Antonin Artaud speaking. Nice. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's it's wild. It's a wild record. And, you know, going back to the I'm, I'm constantly reminded of uh, the enemy review that we got for young fraternity they said um something to the effect of like uh this album's schizophrenic but the subways will find their niche eventually and mm. i've always had like this real problem with that because i've never wanted to find a niche i've always wanted to be wildly kind of like do a bit of this do a bit of that like pulling all these things together because life is so much more than kind of conforming to classification yeah man. um and i feel like uh with this uh, album, we are proudly wearing our schizophrenic <laughs> uh, um, uh, uh, label, you know. Um, so I, I hope people, I hope people enjoy it as much as we um, had fun making it, you know. Um, uh, I know that Charlotte had loads of fun because Charlotte's a big fan of harmony, big fan of keys and that kind of thing. So I'd have this bass line or this guitar line or Josh would have this drum track. And because we're in isolation, she's up in Sheffield in her loft, like spending 10 hours of the day, like layering all these vocals. And I'd sort of get 30 or 40 tracks and try and figure them out. It was, it, you know, piecing this album together was, uh, was like painting, uh, uh, this this portrait, but out of 
you know, jigsaw puzzles and trying to paint the jigsaw puzzle and fit it in. Yeah. You know, it's just like, how is this coming together? But eventually once uh, Adrian Bushby mixed it and we listened back to it, like, yeah, this works. Yeah, nice <laughs> one, works. man. Nice one. Uh, it's exciting. It's such an exciting time for you, man. I'm so buzzed. Um, uh, before we finish up, uh, obviously, you know, what is your message to the people that have been there for the subways, been there for you, uh, you know, anybody that supported you from the beginning of your career up until this point, and also to those that have yet to discover you? Yeah, um, I'd just like to say thank you so much for sticking around. You're absolutely incredible. Um, and uh, to those who haven't yet heard of us, uh, hi, we're the Subways, and I hope uh, our music makes you smile. Um, and more than anything, uh, let's lift all the new bands up that are coming through at the moment. They're absolutely incredible. There has never been a more difficult time to be uh in a, uh, a new band so let's try and support each other as much as we possibly can fantastic fantastic and, and anything you'd like to plug you can plug your own stuff you can plug anything you, anything the band's doing or any bands that you want to promote oh cool yeah well uh, firstly there's this um uh, queer uh, synth pop duo called cat bear who are based in brighton they are unsigned and i think they're making some of the most incredible music going at the moment uh they i feel like they've uh tapped into my heart <laughs> it's like they've 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 seen a window into my soul and then they write a, write a song and i'm like oh my god you have seen me um they they're just absolutely amazing um but also uh if you're a uh a, a new artist or you're in a new band and you want someone to record you and mix your music um i'll be more than happy to do that at my uh, new studio which i've just set up so, fantastic. Yeah. fantastic is the studio public knowledge like where where can people go to yeah find that? uh so it's actually uh, my studio is in a room in uh, a studio called farm factory studios in welling garden city uh but you can get hold of me at billy lunn production.com nice. i think awesome <laughs> i think awesome. that's it brilliant well billy thank you so much for your time today like i say uh, bucket list one for me so uh thank oh. you so much for your time and your energy as well and your honesty Oh, well, uh, thanks for the great questions and uh, thanks for wanting to interview me, Dom. It's been a real pleasure and I hope you have an amazing day. Yeah.